we had the Passover dinner on Friday night. Um, it's okay to talk back. <laughs> it's okay to say something back. So when I say good morning, you're okay to say good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Man, I'm so glad to be here. Hey, a little bit about me real quick. Um, when it starts getting towards the end of the season, when winter is starting to end, I get into a little bit of a rebellious stage where I say winter is officially over for me. So if you see me walking around in shorts and flip-flops and it's 30 degrees outside, just know that I'm rebelling against the weather. It's going to happen every single year. (laughs) Well, I'm Pastor Mike. I'm so glad you're here with us this morning. Go ahead and turn to James chapter 5 a while. Um, I thought a story came to my mind uh, while we were singing that song. I remember back in my college days, uh, if any of you have been to college, you know the struggle that it is sometimes. Um, and when you're relying on God through most of it, you know that it's even more of a struggle. Uh, but there was twice that I remember uh, when I was out there at campus, and our campus was a very small campus. We had a lot of open fields and very few buildings. And I remember one day there was a, a financial issue that came up with the school, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I walked out across what we call West Campus, which was literally just miles of fields, and there were some woods out on the other side of it. And I was walking out, and I was venting to God the entire time. And when I tell you venting, I mean I was yelling at the top of my lungs at God because I didn't understand. I was like, Lord, I, I, you brought me out here, and now here I am, and I'm dealing with all this junk, and this is just not fun. I don't like this. I don't know why we're going through this, and you've got to do something. And I'm just yelling the entire time. And I got out there, and the amazing thing is God let me vent. Like, there was no lightning bolt that struck me in the middle of the field. I didn't die or anything. God allowed me to vent all my frustrations with with what was going on. And I get out to the end, and I'm walking into the woods and everything, and I'm starting to calm down. I'm taking a breath. I'm I'm not yelling as much. My throat was probably hurting anyway. Um, And I remember I, I closed my eyes for a minute, and I opened my eyes. This happened twice to me. I opened my eyes, and there was this big white-tailed deer standing right in front of me, just staring at me. Granted, he probably thought I was nuts, uh, but to me, in that moment, it was God's way of saying, hey, I hear you. I got you. It's going to be okay. When, when we pray, God listens, and we're going through this whole series on the art of prayer, and that's my main point for wanting to make sure you understand is that your prayers are not going out in vain. Like, God is listening, and I'm really excited for this one because we're going to be talking about the power of prayer. Um, but first, let's go through our little joke story here. Uh, bent over and obviously in pain, the old man with a cane hobbled laboriously through the sanctuary and into the pastor's office while the choir practiced. Ten minutes later, he came out, walking upright and moving gracefully and quickly. Good gracious, the choir director explained. Did the pastor heal you by faith? No, the old man said with a smile. He just gave me a cane that wasn't six inches too short. <laughs> All right, if you're in James chapter 5, we're going to go into verse 13. It says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Lord, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you that we can come out, Lord, even when the weather is not looking great, even when things around the world are not going great, Lord, we can just come out and worship you. Lord, I thank you that even though everything around us might be going wrong, even though we might be struggling with different things, Lord, we can sit in your presence and have peace. So, Lord, today I pray that uh, your spirit would just be that peace that passes all understanding that would just sit with us in this room. Lord, I pray that you'd bring that peace I pray, Lord, that answers would be coming for the ones that are looking. Um, But, Lord, I pray today we would be able to to seek after you. We would be able to hear your voice. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to the deepest parts of our hearts, Lord. I pray that you would cut through and and allow us to hear your word. Lord, I pray that these would be your words and not mine. Let them see you and not me. God, we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, like I said, we are going through the art of prayer. And uh, last, uh, the first week, we started with the problem of prayer, and we were talking about you have not because you ask not. 
And then we talked about the process of prayer and how we're supposed to pray with that shameless persistence. Um, and then last week, we talked about the purpose of prayer. We talked about how we're supposed to glorify God first, and His will is ultimate, and then our requests after that. And this week and next week, we're going to be talking about the power of prayer. So this is part one, because when you talk about the power of prayer, there's a lot to that. And even when I was going and preparing for this message, there was a lot that I could not squeeze into the short time that we have together. So honestly, the power of prayer could probably be about a five or six week sermon series. Uh, but we're going to try to cut it down to two um, and then move on from there. But we want to know what that power looks like and what does the power of prayer have over, or what does prayer have uh, the power over? Um, and if you do have the app, something that I did different this week that we're just trying out and see if you like it. Uh, if you go in the app, there's a section on the very front page that says notes. If you click on that, it's going to have all the main notes for the sermon message. Hopefully it, it got on there. I didn't. I forgot to check this morning. Uh, but you'll be able to, it did? Good. Lori says yes. So it's on there. Uh, so you can kind of follow through there, and then that'll help you too later on if you forget what I said, because sometimes we forget after we've eaten lunch. Um, so you can check on there and get refreshed and all that kind of stuff. If you haven't seen the previous weeks, uh, Jeff has do, been doing a great job getting those pushed out onto YouTube, so you can catch up on there um, and go from that point. But first, I want to jump into the second part of verse 16, and it says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And the first word I want to look at is, uh, forgive me for some of these Greek words. I have them written a lot better on my notes with like little dashes so I know how to pronounce them, but I probably am still not doing them right. I took a Greek course in college, I promise you, and my professor, he said his famous saying was, it's still Greek to me, and he studied Greek for years. Uh, so the first word is energeo, and this word is it's used twice in this sentence. It's used for effective and accomplish, and it literally means to be operative, be at work, put forth power to display one's activity. And this word is where we get our word of energy, and energeo represents getting stuff done. Um, it's like when you wake up full of energy in the morning. Did anybody wake up full of energy this morning? Or is everybody falling asleep already? Some people, Yeah. So you know how sometimes you wake up in the morning and it's just one of those mornings where you feel like you slept perfectly all night long and you get up and you're like, I got to clean the entire house from top to bottom. Has anybody ever been there? I have not. <laughs> I don't have that kind of willpower. Uh, it takes me, I, I wake up intentionally two hours before I'm supposed to be anywhere so I can sit and rest for a minute and drink my coffee and eat my breakfast and then get moving. I don't think I've ever woken up like this, but I've seen some people that wake, they wake up in the morning and they're just ready to conquer the world. Uh, but that's the kind of energy we have here is that, that kind of energy that you're just ready to get stuff done. And we're full of that, when we're full of that energy or the energeia, uh, which is the noun version, that's when we can get things done. So energeo represents when we are energetic in, in what we're doing. In other words, these prayers that we're praying that he's talking about in here, they're prayers that are going to get things done. He's saying this is stuff that's actually going to make a difference. This is stuff that's going to move things. And then the other Greek word that I want to look at in there is uh, dikaios, uh, which is the righteousness that we possess. And in a literal sense, it is someone that upholds the law and the, keeps the commands of God, someone that is approved or acceptable of God. It's a person without guilt or fault. Is anybody here without guilt? No. So that's when that, that, this verse kind of messes you up a little bit when you look at it. You're like, well, I can't be that kind of person, so how can my prayers be something that's powerful and effective? We jump back to Isaiah 64, 6, and he points it out for us perfectly. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquity is like the wind takes us away. So it makes this verse a bit complicated because I, in myself, am not a righteous person. So when I look at this verse, I'm like, well, I, I need to figure out who a righteous person is because clearly their, their prayers are more powerful and effective than mine because I'm not righteous. It, it's like what he's talking about here, that dirty rag is what a righteousness is. It's like somebody that takes their, their Kleenex and blows their nose and then hands it to you. Does anybody want that? That would be disgusting. Uh, but that's the kind of righteousness that, that we're looking at. Our righteousness is disgusting like that. It's not worth anything when it's just us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to, uh, him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might find, or that we might become the righteousness of God. 
And then in Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, uh, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So we are not righteous in ourselves. And all righteous means is that you are in right standing with God. We in and of ourselves are not righteous because we're not perfect people. And we've all just admitted to that because I didn't see a single hand go up, which I'm glad because then you'd be lying and that would defeat the whole point. Um, but we are not righteous in ourselves, but that's where Christ comes in because Christ knew no sin, so he was able to become righteousness for us so that when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, then we're able to become righteous just because of him. It's his righteousness that, that's put on us. So now because of that, our prayers are literally powerful and effective. So now looking through all that, we've determined that we are in fact righteous people because of what Jesus did for us. So now we can go on with the rest of the verse. Now we can understand that because of that righteousness, your prayers, the things that you say to God, are powerful and effective. They're things that get stuff done. Now, the, the whole thing with this verse, he, he starts off with talking about suffering, and there's going to be times of suffering. There's going to be times that we deal with stuff. And he says, uh, he starts off the whole thing with saying, if anyone among you is suffering. Now, suffering in itself is a very broad term because we all suffer in different ways. Um, so it's interesting that he used that to, hold, to start the whole thing off. But the Greek word for suffering is uh, kakapatheo, and it means uh, to endure hardships or troubles and to be afflicted. Now, this word is only used four times in Scripture, once here and then three times in 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.3 says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.9 says, For which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. And 2 Timothy 4, 5 says, As for you, always be so reminded, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So every time that Paul has used this word suffering, it's to, to talk about more referring to the suffering for the gospel, which we'll get to a little bit later. But in and of itself, suffering is never easy. We all understand that, right? Has anybody here ever not dealt with any kind of suffering, any kind of pain whatsoever? Good, because then we had to go back to the righteous thing because you'd be lying again. <laughs> we, we deal with suffering as part of life. Whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to deal with some kind of suffering in your life. And generally, it happens quite often, multiple times a year, things are coming against us. And sometimes those suffer sufferings kind of just delay themselves and stick around for a while. And we're like, you know what, I'm done with this junk. We need to move on. Uh, but it's, it's not easy dealing with those sufferings, but at the same time, it's something that is, is part of our lives. Um, John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have, these, uh, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we're going to deal with sufferings in life. And, and that's what James is talking about. He's saying, if any of you are dealing with suffering, and it's, it's funny that he says, if you are, it's like, yeah, we all are. All of us at some point are dealing with something. We need somebody to come and agree with us in prayer. Now, the Gospel Coalition, they list three types of suffering that we could face. The first one is a little hard for us to, to get around, and that's the deserved suffering. Sometimes we suffer because of things that are our fault. I'm sure you realize that sometimes things in your life have happened to you because of something that you personally have done. And you look at it, and you're like, yeah, that was all me. Like, I'm dealing with this because of what I did there, and I, I take ownership of that. It's really hard for us to take fault for those sufferings, though. It's really hard for us to take fault when we're the ones that messed up and caused these issues. Um, I remember when I worked at the hospital, people have a, a tendency so much of trying to push the blame off onto everybody else when it's their fault. And I saw that so many times in the hospital. And I, I don't know if it's because people just don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to go to the principal's office or something. Um, but there were so many times with me being in leadership, they'd, and something would come up, and it was a big issue, and I'd be like, well, who calls this? Well, it was so-and-so, and I'd go to so-and-so, and they'd be like, no, it was so-and-so. I'd go to them, no, it was so-and-so, and, -so. and it'd just be this round and round about. We only had like five people on the team, and they'd all be blaming each other for this one thing, and in my mind, I'm like, listen, I drove a school bus for eight years. I know whose fault it is. I'm just waiting for you to tell me the truth. Uh, but everybody likes to pass that blame. We don't like to accept the fault that we actually did something, especially if it's something in our lives. We don't like to say, yeah, my life is kind of messed up right now because I did something wrong. Luke 12, 2 through 3 says, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, 
or hidden that uh, will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. It's, it's hard for us to accept when we mess up like that, but it's all going to come out eventually. And usually when it comes out, that's when everything just kind of blows up and causes a lot of issues. And we think sometimes when we do things, uh, we think, well, it's not hurting anybody. Nobody's going to find out about it. I'll just do this, and it'll be okay. That's not the truth, because eventually it's going to come out, and no matter how little it is, it's going to hurt somebody else. We have to fess up to the fact that we're the ones that did those. In James 5.16, James tells us to confess our sins to each other. So the beautiful thing here, though, is that even if we have caused the suffering, even if I'm the one that started the whole issue for why my life is just spiraling downhill, he still has grace. The Lord still says, just come back to me. Just come to me. We'll figure it out. We'll take care of the situation. Even if you're the one that messed up, it's not like God saying, dude, stay back. You need to go sit in the corner for a little while or something. Now, God says, come on, let's figure it out together. We'll work through the situation. So even in the moments where we mess up, the Lord calls us back to him. He says, repent of these sins, and we'll figure it out from there. So the other type of suffering they talk about is innocent suffering. And this is when we did nothing wrong to cause the issue. It wasn't our fault. We weren't to blame at all. Uh, these are the ones that are a little easier to accept because it's like, oh, yeah, that was actually their fault. That's their problem. I'm dealing with it because of that person. We suffer at the hands of others through their wrongdoings. And there's a lot of issues that come up from that. It can be simple stuff from somebody lying about you and causing a mess at work or, or maybe somebody was driving drunk and hit somebody and the, you lost a family member because of it. It wasn't their fault. It was the fault of somebody else, and we have that a lot in our lives where, just like I said, with the deserved suffering, we cause an issue, and it blows up, and everybody else is affected. Well, with innocent suffering, you didn't cause the issue. Somebody else did, but now it's blowing up, and it's affecting you. And this could also be stuff like financial issues or health suffering. Um, there are obviously times that financial might fall under the deserved uh, suffering, stuff that we messed up on. But there's a lot of times, too, that it wasn't our fault at all. Like right now, we look at our country, we got high gas prices, we got inflation in our foods and our products, uh, we're, we're struggling to pay rents and mortgages, it's, it's a hard time financially, and a lot of people are, are losing hope because they're like, well, where am I going to come up with these finances to cover this stuff? It's not that it's their fault, they didn't cause this issue, but they're suffering because of it. Or maybe you're suffering because of a health issue. Uh, a lot of times, and, and health, like, just like financial, health issues could easily fall under the deserved. There's a lot of things that, a lot of sins that we commit that causes us to, to get issues in our body. But there's also issues that come up that we had no control over. They just came up, and now we're dealing with it. And it's a, a hard fact of life, but it's not something that you caused, and it's not something that you can control. Last year... Um, my family and I, we suffered through one of the driest seasons I've ever seen in my life. We, uh, we knew God had called us to move to Pennsylvania, and God was faithful to provide more than enough to get us there, but he didn't fully explain what was going to happen once we got to Pennsylvania, and I didn't realize how hard it was going to be. We, in Arkansas, we were good. We were comfortable. We, were, we weren't struggling too bad. We were, we were good. Um, Pennsylvania, I was driving an hour every day just to get to work. I was the only income that we had in the house. And we just had Ezekiel uh, in August, just a few months after we had moved there. And we hit a hard financial season. And I, I feel like God had taught us things through that. Uh, but I also feel like it was the enemy attacking us, trying to get us to give up on what God was calling us to. But we go through these seasons in life where things are going to get rough. Um, my, this is a random thing. My, uh, my Aunt Teresa, she lives down in Florida. And I saw the other day, I was so proud of her. This is the power of prayer. I'm getting somewhere with this story, I promise you. But uh, she lives in Florida. She's the, uh, was it the president of the housing authority for her county. Um, and everybody looking at her now, they're like, oh, that's so awesome. Like, you're, you're up there, you're doing all this great stuff and everything. But they don't see the full story of what happened to get her to that point. When I was a kid, she was into drugs bad. 
Uh, I remember her living in a, a bad part of the city, and we'd go over there to visit her, and it was a dangerous situation for us. There was always drugs in the house. It wasn't a good place to be. And a lot of people, especially her parents, had prayed and prayed for years that God would do something in her life. And it took a while, and she uh, eventually got connected with this group. Um, it's called New Life for Girls in Pennsylvania. And she basically went and stayed at their facility for an extended period of time. Um, it was a Christian-based organization, and she got to come to know the Lord. She got to accept him. And even as, as poor as she was at the time from being in the lifestyle that she was, God lifted her out of that, that pit of misery, and now she's the, the president of the housing authority. They just built this huge apartment complex, like something like 100 apartments for seniors in Florida. And it's amazing seeing all that, and I tell her all the time how proud I am of her because I've seen how far she's come. But that's the power of prayer sometimes is that we, God likes to take us from where we are and put us in a new place. And we might not always see what that's going to look like. Sometimes it's hard to go through those seasons because we look and we're like, well, Lord, there's no direction whatsoever here. Like, I don't know where I'm going. I'm stuck in this place. I'm not moving anywhere. I'm struggling with everything I can possibly deal with. And God says, yeah, but I have a plan. And he doesn't reveal the whole thing to us, but he's got a plan. And sometimes you have to believe in that plan. You have to trust that what the Lord is doing is going to work it out for your good, even if you have to go through some of these struggles and these sufferings to get there. Oh, where was I now? Oh, let's jump to the next verse. Oh, the third type of suffering, that's what it is. The third type of suffering is that righteous suffering, uh, which is what we talked a little bit at, about at the beginning. And righteous suffering is not something that we're sinning. It's not our fault. In fact, we're doing everything right. Uh, but instead, we're suffering for the gospel. We're suffering because of the values and principles that we stand on when we believe in Jesus. John 15, 18 through 25 says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know who, him who has sent me. If I had come and spoken to them, they would, have, uh, not, or they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that uh, no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. We're living in a blessed nation, and we have been for a really long time. Um, we don't fully understand what uh, persecution looks like in the rest of the world. We don't understand what it really looks like to be under righteous suffering. But we do have an extent of it. We might not be getting killed and tortured for our faith. We might not be struggling to that extent. But there's still a lot of suffering that people go through for the gospel, even in this country. We're still having to deal with issues uh, like hostility and ill treatment within our very own country. And I'm sure some of you might have even felt that within your life already. It's not some big thing where it's like, oh, I don't know how you survive, but it, it's still stuff that's happening to us. Matthew 5, 11 through 12 says, Blessed are you uh, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is talking about uh, different degrees of persecution, and we, we've been seeing uh, a higher levels of persecution in our country that have been coming against us over the past few years. Um, probably one of the biggest ones that some people don't like to admit was COVID. Uh, when COVID started, it was, it was pretty simple, but very quickly, churches were forced to close down. Christians were not allowed to meet. And I know a lot of businesses were affected by it. Um, but what I noticed when we were going through it is that churches were the last ones that were allowed to reopen. And even in that, we had our neighbors to the north that were restricting still um, what Christians were allowed to do. Uh, we had a lot of pastors that were being literally chased into the woods 
uh, for their faith and were being arrested and pulled in because they were trying to gather just a small group of people to talk about Jesus. Um, even in our, our town of Chicago, we had um, the, the mayor and, and the city forces that were pounding down on church doors to, to force them to close and go home, and they were holding legal issues against them if they didn't. Um, so to look on that and say, well, it was just because of COVID is not a good excuse. We were definitely facing persecution in those times. Uh, not a lot of churches had to deal with those extents, but we definitely had to deal with issues in our country because of it. Um, and that was one of the things that I was worried about when it first came up. I, I had a feeling stuff like that was going to go down. Uh, I remember when I worked at the hospital, uh, when I started working at the hospital in Arkansas, during my interview, uh, I was talking to the director at the time, and she told me, she knew I was a youth pastor, she knew I was a Christian, and she said, now I'll let you know there's people down in that department that don't uh, follow your system of beliefs. I said, yeah, I get that. I'm like, I'm a youth pastor. I understand that. I've been a school bus driver for a long time. I get the world is out there. We're not just a Christian bubble. I understand those things. And she said, well, I want you to know there's, there's some people down there that are LGBT. She said there's a Mormon down there that's going to be working in your office. Or not Mormon, uh, Muslim. Um, she said there's, there's these people in your department. I said, yeah, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Uh, and I didn't realize it for a long time, but after that interview she had gone and started talking to everybody in our department, basically talking about how awful of a Christian I was, how I'd be hateful towards their lifestyles and different things. And the, only the, the point that I realized that uh, one of the triage nurses, I was talking with her one day, and her and I had become close because her office was right beside mine. We had to talk a lot and everything. Uh, and she was married to a woman. Um, and she came to me one day, and she was like, you know, I didn't think you'd be so nice. I was like, what are you talking about? She was like, well, uh, your boss told me you're one of those Christians that doesn't really love and care about people. And she said, I, I, don't, I don't see that. And it hurt for a minute, but that's the kind of life we live in. People find out about us, and they automatically assume the worst. But what this lady saw, what this nurse saw, was that I was the type of Christian that would love her despite what her lifestyle was. Like, I might, she knew I didn't agree with it, and, and I'll stand here and tell you I don't agree with it, but... At the same time, I'm not going to hate you for it because my ultimate goal is that I want you to know who Jesus is. I want you to be able to experience that love and joy that we have from the Father. And then after you come into that relationship, I'll let the Holy Spirit deal with that. Like, it's not my job to change you. That is not my job at all. I'm to love you through the whole thing. So if you ask me, I'll tell you what I believe, but I'm still going to love you anyway. And then, of course, we had a lot of Christian business owners over the past few years that they've suffered through a lot of the LGBT community, bakers and florists and everything, that their businesses have pretty much been shut down because they weren't willing to back down from their principles that they had to deal with. So even though we are not suffering through death and torture in this country, there's still a lot of, of persecution that's going to come across us. Now, I'm not going to dig into this too much because we don't have enough time to go through an entire sermon on Christian persecution, so we'll move on. Um, but we, then we have power over suffering. James goes on to say, if, uh, is anyone among you sick? And we suffer through sickness a lot um, in this life. And I know a lot of people right now are dealing with uh, different illnesses and sicknesses. And um, some of them long term, some of them, like my boys, they just got a runny nose that they're dealing with. Um, but we deal with a lot of unfortunate illnesses in our life. And the, the fact of the matter is that's just a part of the fall because of sin. Sin came into the world, and so does sickness and death. Romans 6.23, that first part there, says, for the wages of sin is death. So literally, when sin came into the world, illness, sickness, and death were all introduced to us too. So it's a hard fact of life, but it's something that we have to deal with. It's something that we're going to have to go through. When Adam and Eve took that first bite, sin entered the world and brought that into us. But through the power of Jesus' name, we can pray over sickness. We can believe for healing in Jesus' name. That's something we see throughout Scripture, where Jesus has the power to go and heal people miraculously more than we can ever understand. People that had dealt with illnesses and sicknesses for years and years and years, Jesus just came along and boom, they're healed just like that. 
Jeremiah 17, 14 says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. So I want to look at some examples of healing. Um, and we could automatically go into all the healings that Jesus did. And, and he did some amazing healings. In fact, he did so many healings in his lifetime that we don't even have them all recorded. In uh, John 21, 25, it says, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did, where every one of them to, where any, every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Jesus heals so many people. We don't have enough bookshelves. We don't have enough libraries in the world to contain everything that he did in this world while he was living. Just for those three years of ministry, he did that much stuff. So we're not going to look specifically at Jesus and his healings because he obviously is God and is able to do whatever he can. Um, I want to look more at what the apostles did because it was the apostles that used the power of prayer after they received the Holy Spirit to be able to heal people. So Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, Now Peter and John were going out to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at, them, uh, at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him and, and praising God and recognizing him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms, and they were filled with uh, wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So this is the first time we see a miraculous healing after the apostles had received the Holy Spirit. When Peter received the Holy Spirit, he was given the power through the Holy Spirit to go out and make these things happen. Um, it was in faith that he commanded this man to, to get up and walk. Uh, sometimes I look at that verse, and I'm like, I'm not sure if I have that strong of faith. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be able to walk up to somebody and really have enough faith to be like, hey, get up and walk, unless God himself told me to go over there and do it. I don't know, because I'd be thinking, well, what if I say that and he doesn't? That'd be awkward. <laughs> but Peter and John had faith to go up to this man and say, get up and walk. And he got up and walked. And uh, I remember there was, so there was this, this guy that a few years, six years ago, uh, he, he's a worship leader. And this was at the time that Lou and I were struggling to have kids. We didn't know if that was ever going to happen. And one night, late at night, I was, I was praying, and I was just crying out to God about the whole issue. And I heard this guy sing for the first time. And the video, he started with his testimony. And uh, he was a worship pastor, uh, but he came down with a terrible tongue cancer, and it had spread to different parts of his body. Um, and the doctor basically told him, you're never going to be able to sing again. You're never going to be able to walk again. You're done. Uh, and that was what he had, had heard, but it wasn't what he was going to believe. Um, so him and a lot of other family members and friends started really praying and believing in faith that God was going to heal him. And in this video, he said, and, and here I am, I'm walking, I'm singing, I'm praising God like never before. And the song that he sang, I, I'm going to play it in a couple of weeks here because it's part of another sermon, but uh, it really got me through a lot of life's hardest times because it talked about how um, I keep circling these walls, and I don't see anything happening, but I'm believing anyway. I'm going to believe that one day these walls are going to fall. And sometimes it's hard to believe that when we're going through stuff. Sometimes it's hard to believe that God's going to make something happen. Sometimes it's hard to believe and have the faith that God's going to heal us or God's going to provide for us when we're going through these situations. But he does. I really want you to understand that. And that's the whole point of this whole sermon I want you to understand the power of prayer in your life. Amen. Gosh, I keep getting off topic here. Let's go back onto the sermon. <laughs> Acts 5, 12 through 16, another example. Uh, now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, and the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multiple, or multitudes of both men and women, 
so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on the cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. This was a time that miracles were happening all over the place. The, the power of the Holy Spirit was being poured out in such a strong way. And granted, it was needed in that time because the church was just starting and the world needed to see who God was. So we saw these huge miraculous healings and everything that was happening to the point where they're literally laying their sick on the ground, hoping that Peter, who was not Jesus, would just walk by and his shadow would come over them and they would receive healing from it. And that's how much faith they had. Like they had heard about what the Holy Spirit was doing through these men. They heard about the miracles that were happening and they had faith that, man, if I just bring my relative out here and lay him on the street, as Peter walks by, that shadow is going to come on him, and he's going to be healed just like that. They had such extreme faith to believe that that's what, what was going to happen. In verse 15, James says that the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. We have to believe in the healing power of Christ. It's so prevalent throughout the entire scriptures. It happens over and over and over again, and this is what we're told. Believe this. Have faith in what God's going to do. The disciples and the apostles believed it. The people from all over that were coming in all believed it. We see this healing power constantly. Now, one of the big questions that comes up when we talk about healing is, what if the healing doesn't come? That's one of the hardest questions sometimes, especially as a pastor when people come and ask me that, because... Oftentimes, it's because they're, they're at their wit's end. Nothing's changing. They're not getting any better. They're only getting worse. And the question is, what if it just doesn't happen? And you have a lot of preachers that are, that are out there that you come and ask them that, and they're going to be like, oh, well, it's because you didn't have enough faith. You didn't have enough faith to believe. Or the person that needed healing, maybe you were praying for somebody else, they didn't have enough faith. It's all about faith. I, I disagree completely with them. Um, just because you're not seeing the healing, don't feel like you don't have enough faith. Don't think that you are not a strong enough Christian because nothing's happening. Because that's not the case at all. Matthew 17, 20 says, He said to them, Because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So even if your faith is small, Jesus can still use it to do great things. So it's not your faith that's the problem. You can have all the faith in the world, but it doesn't mean that our prayers are always going to be answered. It doesn't mean that the healing is always going to come. And that's an unfortunate thing that we have to understand sometimes. But when it does happen, I just turn back to God's will. And that's hard to accept because we are what we call finite creatures. And we serve an infinite God, which means that for us, we have a beginning and an end. You were born, and one day you'll die, and then you'll live for eternity somewhere else. Um, so you have that, but we're not infinite. So I don't know what happened before I was born. I don't know the things that transpired. I don't know when God created the heavens and the earth. I don't know what he was doing before he created those things. And I'm not going to try to understand it. Because I have a finite mind. I'm not limitless. I'm limited in my ability to understand what's going on. So when things don't happen, when the prayers are not being answered, it hurts. But I'm not going to try to understand what God's doing. Because God understands way more than I do. God sees from beginning to end. And sometimes it's hard to understand when somebody passes away from something that God should have healed them from. But sometimes we just have to divert back to God's will and say, you know what, Lord, as much as it hurts, your will be done. Because I still believe, as much as I sometimes have a struggle with it, I still believe that God is the giver and taker of life. When we were struggling to have kids, I really struggled with that. Because I didn't understand, Lord, why, why are you giving me kids when all these other people that don't deserve them are having kids? I fought with that for a while. But I had to come to the conclusion that it's not my will, but yours. I, I still don't understand why it took us so long to have kids, and I never will this, this side of, of heaven. But I'm not going to lose my faith because of it. I'm not going to struggle with who I am in God just because something didn't happen the way I wanted it to. 
Mandisa passed away uh, earlier, and I, I read a story of hers, and um, you might have heard of it too, but at one point, a friend of hers had passed away from breast cancer, and when that happened, it, it put Mandisa in a very, very dark place for a while, and she had said when she passed away, it took the, or shook the foundations underneath me. I sank into a deep pit of depression, um, and it was to the point that Mandisa even considered taking her life because of this whole issue. Everybody knows who Mandisa is, right? Maybe I should have started with that. She was a big worship singer. She was an American Idol. She just passed away a little while ago. Um, but it was terrible that her friend passed away. And she'll never understand why that had to happen. But there was good that came out of it. Because through Mandisa going into this, this deep pit of depression, God was able to use that. And I'm not saying that's ultimately the reason why her friend passed away. But Mandisa's faith was able to grow because of that, because she got to the bottom of the bottom, and all she could rely on was God. And then through that, when she came out of her, her deep pit of despair, she uh, started counseling, and she wrote a book called Out of the Dark. And that's helped so many people be able to come out of their parts of depression to help them deal with their mental health issues that they were going through. That book would have never been written. Mandisa would have never gone through that time in her life. So I don't understand fully why God allowed her friend to pass away, but I know that God used it for good in the end. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 9 says, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. So I believe personally that the healing comes one of two ways. The way that I pray for is that you'll get miraculous healing here and now, and you'll be able to walk fancy free after that. And the other type of healing is that you pass from this world and you go on to paradise and you don't have to deal with it anymore. Those are the two ways that you're going to get your healing. So I believe that God heals either way. One way or the other, you're getting your healing. So the question then is, should we stop praying? Because if God's not going to fix it, should we stop praying? Absolutely not. You need to keep praying. You need to keep believing that the healing is coming. Because the minute you stop praying, the minute you stop believing, you surrender to what the enemy is trying to do. One of my favorite quotes by Charles Spurgeon. I love this thing. He said, never give up praying, not even though Satan should suggest to you that it is in vain for you to cry unto God. Pray in his teeth. Pray without ceasing. For if for a while the heavens are as brass and your prayer only echoes in thunder above your head, pray on. If month after month your prayer appears to have miscarried and no reply has been vouchsafed to you, yet still continue to draw nigh unto the Lord. Do not abandon the mercy seat for any reason whatsoever. There should never be a point that we stop praying. Even if it feels like we've been dealing with this issue for such a long time and God's not doing anything. I love how he says that, pray in his teeth. When the enemy is standing there telling you, you're stupid for doing this. You're wasting your time. Why are you even bothering trying to cry out to God because you're not doing anything? You pray in his teeth. You get right up there in the enemy's face and you continue to pray to God. Do not stop praying because eventually the answer is going to come. Eventually the healing is going to come. Eventually the provision is going to come. Eventually, the season is not going to last forever. You know, one of my, my favorite things is raining out. It's cloudy out and everything. And sometimes when it gets rainy and stormy and cloudy like that, it's hard to even think. I, you remember, okay, step back a while to when we first got here. Remember when it was like raining and cloudy for like months on end? And it seemed like it was not ending? There was a moment when I was like, is the sun even up there anymore? <laughs> like, does it even exist? But the beautiful thing is eventually those clouds left. And the amazing thing that I love is that the sun had never left. The sun was always there. Whether you could see it or not, the sun was still there. If you would have gotten on an airplane and flown up way up into the sky, 30,000, 40,000 feet, whatever it took, the sun would have been there. Because, you ready for this? The sun is always faithful. When we're in our prayer time, sometimes it's hard to Imagine the sun is still there. Sometimes it's hard to imagine that Jesus is still listening to us. But I, I promise you, the sun is still there. He's still sitting on the throne. 
He's still shining in all of his glory. He's still there listening to you, even if it feels like you're going through a season where things just could not get any worse. He's still there listening to every word you have to say. And the answer is coming. So James 5.14 again says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So today we're going to take some time to put our sermon to action. Um, and if you've got to leave, that's fine. I understand. Uh, I remember uh, the last church I was in, whenever we got to altar time, we had like the same people that as soon as pastor said, they'd get up and go out into the foyer or something. Uh, but if you need to leave, you got lunch plans, whatever it is, it's fine. I'm not going to call you out for getting up and walking out the door. Um, but we need to take a time to put our words to actions. So we're going to be praying. So we're going to have the stewardship team, if they're able, come on up.